Just a quick recap of what we did so far for object detection. We are still doing two-stage detectors. We started with a metric, and then we said uh, you can try to, that's a complicated problem, object detection. So one approach to try to solve this problem is a divide and conquer method. So you divide the problem into pieces, and then you conquer one at a time. So the first stage was to extract the regions, then warp the regions, push them through your CNN, get some features, and then do uh, per class classification. And the algorithm worked, but there was still a lot of room for improvement. Like there was no need for this warping stage. There was no need for support vector machines. And there is actually no need for an external algorithm like selective search to propose regions for us. And each paper that came after this was addressing one of these problems. So the first one was saying you don't need to warp. And actually, you can save a lot of computations by sharing computations. Then uh, there is also no need for the support vector machines. You can have a multitask loss. The next one came along and said there is no need for uh, bounding box proposal. You can actually use a neural network to do that. And that was the region proposal network. And then this last one was actually to save some computations, the ones that you were doing in this uh, fully connected part of your network, the head of fast RCN. You can actually get rid of the head, replace it with a convolution, and there is no need for any neural network. So you can have a depth of zero. So no neural network for your region of interest. So basically there is no computation at all happening afterwards, just the softmax and the bond bounding box regressor. That's it. And that's how you get the softmax. But they had a challenge and the challenge was if you want to do that, if you want to get rid of the head of uh, fast RCNN, then everything is going to be convolutional and it's going to be translation invariant. But for object detection, translation matters. It matters where the object is. That's why you need it to have position sensitive score maps. So these have to be sensitive to the location of the object. Is it on top right, top left? Where is it? And even after all of these trouble, if you look at small images, small objects in your images, big objects in your images, and medium sized image objects, there is still room for improvement because your algorithm might miss small objects and the bounding box is not being accurate. And that's the topic of the next paper. One solution for it, for you to be able to look at different scales in your image, is to actually input multiple images of different scales. Of uh, It's the same image, but it's gonna have different resolution. And by doing so, you're gonna be able to focus on larger objects on your small images and on smaller objects on your larger scales. And then you push it through your neural networks and then you do your predictions. But then somebody might say, why do you need multiple images? There is already a feature, and this is called image pyramid. There is only a pyramid structure within the layers of a deep neural network. So you have a high resolution image and then each one of these feature maps are gonna be of lower resolution. So you might be able to use uh, to do prediction on all of these, and that could give you multiple resolution. That's a good idea, but there is a problem. And the problem is that uh, the thicker blue lines that you see here, they denote that the features at that layer are semantically stronger. So the features at the first few layers are focusing on the edges or color, etc. But the ones toward the end have meaning, for instance, they have some features encoding the existence of, a, of an object, of a cat, a dog, etc. So they are discriminative. So the ones at top are semantically stronger. So this idea needs some adjustments and we need to make these features or feature maps semantically stronger. And the way you do it is by inheriting from the layer above. So you're gonna have a bunch of op resolutions going on and then somehow inherit the features that you learned from the lower resolution feature maps and then try to make these features 
feature maps stronger. And then you can do your predictions. And now all of these are going to be semantically strong. And at the same time, they're going to give you a pyramid to work with. And the pyramid is going to give you multiple scales. So that's the big picture. And once you do that, you're going to put your bounding boxes or your region proposals, regions of interest, on different scales. Now you can do predictions at per each uh, small box or region of interest that you have. To do your detections, this is going to be objects of smaller size, and these are going to be objects of bigger size. Okay, let's go a little bit into details. So as far as the notation is concerned, let's say C2, C3, C4, and C5 are the outputs of the residual blocks corresponding to conf2, conf3, conf4, conf5 in a residual network. So each one of these are gonna be of lower resolution compared to the original image. C2 is gonna be four times smaller than the original image. C3 is gonna be eight times smaller. C4, 16, and C5, 32 smaller. And this is actually the total stride at that particular layer. Now the question is, what is this operation? How do you inherit those, feature, those features? Are you concatenating? What are you doing? So let's focus on that part. We want to come up with P2, P3, P4, and P5, and they correspond to these semantically stronger versions of C2, C3, C4, and C5. And these are the ones that we are gonna end up working with. From layer above, all you need to do is you do an upsampling, because now you want these two feature maps to have the same resolution. So you do an upsampling, and it could be as simple as a nearest neighbor upsampling from C, this is gonna be C, let's say C4. The other problem is that may, maybe the number of channels are gonna be different. Therefore, you're gonna need to use a one by one convolution to adjust the number of channels. And then once you adjust the number of channels, once you do your upsampling, you can add them together and then uh, go to the next step try to make P5 semantically more stronger. So that's the idea. Now the question is, we know that the two stage detectors are gonna have two stages. The first one is proposing regions and the other one is uh, pooling those, those regions, ROI pooling, region of interest pooling. For region proposal network, you're gonna have 15 anchors. Previously you had nine anchors, now you're gonna have 15 anchors. The question is, where are you going to put these anchors? Are you going to put them on uh, one of these, on all of these? And how do you spread them if you decided to put the anchors on uh, all of these P2, P3, P4, and P5? So what you're going to do is you're going to put uh, anchors that have areas of 32 squared on P2, the ones that have areas of 64 squared on uh, P3, Etc. So you're going to have five of them per each of these semantically stronger feature maps. And then you're going to have three aspect ratios, the aspect ratios being equal or not equal. And three times five is going to give you 15 anchors per each of these feature maps. So your region proposal network needed anchors, and these are the anchors. Now your region proposal network is going to be able to do its job as before. Once it is trained, it's going to be able to give us, uh, propose to us regions. And those regions are going to be consumed by the object detector, which is in the form of uh, fast RCNF. But there is still the question of uh, if the region proposal network proposes a region, then to which uh, feature map are you going to assign that proposed region? Because you're going to need to pull information from one of these which one of these arrows are you going to use? So you need to assign the proposed region to one of these for you to be able to do your pooling operations. So forget about the intuition for a second, and let's just look at the mechanics. You're going to have a region of interest of size W by H, and the question is to which one of these P1, P2, P2, P3, P4, P5, or P6 are you going to assign this? Let's say K0 is 4, so if W times H, its square root is 224, log 2 is going to be 0. So you're going to assign this region of interest 
to the fourth feature map. This one corresponds to CON4. So you have a region, you have a box on your original image. Now you're assigning it to the fourth one. Now, let's say W times H, it's a square root, is one half of 224. That's why you have the log two here. Then this is gonna be negative one. And then you are assigning that region of interest to P3, because it's gonna be four minus one, it's gonna give you three. So you're assigning it to P3. It means that now you're pulling your information from P3. And that's the intuition. If the region of interest scale becomes smaller, then you're gonna map it to a level below. You start with four, then you go to three, two, and if it's bigger, it's two times bigger, you're gonna assign it to uh, P5, P6, etc. So is this clear? Are the, I don't know if we're gonna talk about this next, but are the, the prediction heads the same as the what we saw in the previous paper? It's not the previous paper, but the one before it. Okay. But uh, you can actually use what you learned from the previous paper on top of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for you to save more computations, you can use that. But it's very similar to faster RCNN. The only thing that you're changing is that you want to look at multiple resolution, multiple scales. And that's going to help you detect objects at different scales, even the small ones. Okay, let's see some results on Microsoft Coco. So far, we're doing Pascal VLC. Microsoft Coco is another set of benchmark for object detection systems. And uh, let's compare this to faster or CNN with a residual network as its baseline. The proposals, if they are coming from C4, for that case, they are coming from C4. And there is no lateral or top-down connections like these ones or that ones. That's your average piece, average uh, precision at 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is uh, the intersection over union. And uh, the cool thing about Microsoft Coco benchmark is that it has specialized metrics for small objects, medium-sized objects, and large objects. And this is the total one. And uh, that paper was not reporting these numbers. So you can copy and paste the same baseline, and then you, you retrain your networks. You can use CON4, like what uh, we saw here. We can use C4, or you can use C5. And it turns out that using C4 is better now you also have these numbers that you can start comparing to. Now the feature pyramid network is gonna not only use C4, C5, it's gonna use uh, C2, C3, C4, and C5. Actually, it's gonna use the semantically stronger version of them. It has lateral at top-down connections and it's doing overall very good on the small objects and medium-sized objects. It's doing much better than before, but you lost some uh, average precision for larger objects. So there seems to be a trade-off between the small objects, medium-sized objects, and large objects. If your algorithm focuses on small objects, then you might miss some information. Maybe your bounding boxes are not in the correct location on larger objects. But it's still, overall, it's doing much better than before. And it's uh, as fast as uh, the previous versions. Why? Because you're only pushing one image through your network rather than multiple images at different scales. And how does it compare with the rest of the methods out there? These two works, they're actually using image pyramid. They're pushing multiple images through the network. And even competing with those that are pushing multiple images using image pyramids, these are doing very good on the small and medium sized objects and overall. And on larger objects, these two methods are doing better, but they are using image pyramids. What accounts for uh, this this model performing so much better than those other two that are still using, like in this other one's using ResNet as well and Image Pyramid? Maybe it's because they have some more parameters here. Okay, so just a larger network. Yeah, this one is using ResNet 101. This one is also using ResNet 101, but there is a there's a bunch of parameters here. Okay. Uh, any questions? I'm confused about the top table. There's the line with the star, like the baseline from head all, and then the A baseline on con four. And it looks like it's exactly the same thing. And why are the numbers different then? Uh, these guys have a better implementation. 
compared to that one. So it's just a matter of implementing it better. And based on the same better implementation, they are comparing it to feature pyramid network. So they are not comparing themselves to the baseline. They made some improvements and now they are using that. Okay. And they also didn't have these numbers. They were not reporting it at that time. By better implementation, do you just mean like the the details of, I don't know, initialization and epoch numbers and all of that? Yes, and training and uh, okay. scheduling, your learning rate, etc. So it's not, it's not the architecture is any different. They just trained it a little differently. Yes. Okay. I think so. And maybe there are some minor modifications to the architecture. But yeah, because if you want to compare feature pyramid network with that one, it's probably not a fair comparison. Yeah. So you first improve it and then you compare to the improvement. Yeah. Cool.